as you will see after I start lecturing, Butch greatly exaggerates my teaching skills. And I think your memory somehow is dimmed uh, of those times. In fact, I don't even remember the name of the course that I taught at that time. But I know what happened. <laughs> uh, those of you who are here on Tuesday, thank you for coming back. That's a good sign. Uh, and those of you who weren't, uh, you missed a great lecture last time. Uh, so uh, we'll start a new one. Uh, so here we go. Uh, again, uh, there is my uh, uh, email address. So especially younger people in the room, students in the room, uh, young faculty, if you want to pursue any of these issues uh, and get into annoying debates with me uh, and you don't feel you can have time to do it in here, uh, well, take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, just send me an email. I'll be delighted to correspond with you. Um, this is for the students in, in the room. Uh, first of all, uh, aren't there some empty chairs up here? There are two here. Um, there's one there. Two very attractive men on either side. So, and there's one there. So, I, those of you in back, uh, you should come up and sit here. I promise I will not call on you if you <laughs> come up here. Students do this, you know. They hide back there, hoping, fearing that they'll be called on. I promise I won't. I also want to uh, remind you that I will have office hours prior to each of these lectures. Uh, somewhere downstairs on the second floor. It doesn't have a number on the office, I don't think, uh, but it has my name on it. And uh, if you want to come and talk about your work uh, uh, or mine, uh, I'd be delighted to have you, have you come, so please do. And if that doesn't work for you, if you have a conflict uh, and you'd still like to meet with me uh, sometime Wednesday afternoon, uh, then please uh, send me an email. You now have it. So send me an email and we'll try to arrange something else. There it is, again. So serious about that. Uh, okay, um, is it also true that you have handouts of, so they do exist. It was alleged that you'd have them. I want to be sure you did because especially those of you back here who refused to move up here, uh, if you had my eyes, you wouldn't be able to see the tables that are that are, will be coming up. Um, so we'll have them for you. Okay, uh, as before and with all my lectures, I will shamelessly advertise my work uh, uh, before we proceed. Uh, and this is a, the stuff that I rely on in this lecture. There is this absolutely wonderful paper, wonderful paper that Kevin O'Rourke, who is a past student of mine, and now he's a famous economic historian and economist in, in Europe and Ireland, uh, on this topic and, and uh, trying to reassess the impact of, uh, of Columbus and also da Gama uh, on world markets. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to say is going to relate to that. And no doubt you're wondering, my god, is he going to lecture on 1492? I want answers to now. I don't want answers to 14. Well, listen, I'm going to try to persuade you that that evidence is quite relevant to the kinds of economic analysis you bring to contemporary global problems and debates over assessing evidence. Um, I think, uh, I'm hoping that you, you might find this, uh, you know, uh, look back, way back in history, helpful big debate on this issue. When did globalization be begin? It's going to depend very much on how you define it. Uh, and then it goes on and it goes on uh, uh, and on. Um, and there's the book that, uh, uh, that you kindly advertised. Uh, so those of you who weren't here on Tuesday, that's the book that I lectured on uh, on Tuesday that I want you all to go out and buy. I have grandchildren that are getting to college age. <laughs> and these sales will help. So 
Isn't that true, Nancy? <laughs> this is my wife, Nancy. I can't believe that she comes and listens to me on these. She does. But she hasn't heard this one before. She had heard the previous one about eight times. And I... OK, so question, why do I want to force you uh, to look at this very, very old history? Um, and the, I want to persuade you that there's nothing new. In all the contemporary debates involving policy, assessing performance, uh, uh, commodity price shocks, uh, uh, the increased scarcity of resources and foodstuffs, uh, and how countries will deal with that, hostily probably, um, that all of those issues, including the issues involving migration, uh, what determines the exit rates, what determines the in-migration rates, what role policy, assimilation, remittances, blah, 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 all that stuff. We've been there and done it already. We are living now in the second global century, and we've already went through all of this before, uh, uh, up to 1913. We're just kind of rediscovering it. So it seems a pity uh, to throw away all the social experiment that was already performed uh, over the century up to 1913, uh, which has already yielded a lot of answers and insights, seems a pity to ignore that and when you're confronting contemporary problems. Uh, so I'm going to try to persuade you that uh, uh, that's one reason to look uh, at this stuff. But the, uh, the issues that matter is how to measure openness. Uh, economists who are otherwise extremely bright and clever keep messing up on this issue. They are really can be stupid. Uh, and it's just amazing. They're otherwise so clever. How could they mess this up uh, so badly? So we want to talk about that, uh, why I think that's true. I want to talk about when did it start and why. That is, what are the determinants uh, of uh, the evolution of global markets for labor and capital and, and goods, and also ideas. Um, in particular, I'm going to be, most of the attention is going to be focused on trade. Uh, and so the big question is going to be, what explains the trade boom? You remember when you were bored to death taking history and you were, had spent one day on the age of discovery and all that stuff uh, and read about all these male heroes that are leaving Iberia and, and Britain. Uh, beating up on the rest of the world and exploiting them. Um, there was a trade boom that was generated. Uh, and uh, wouldn't you like to know what was driving that trade boom? Uh, so we're going to develop a little, simple little economic model that allows you to decompose the sources of the trade boom. It isn't going to be double digit. You got to forget about double digits when you're, when you're looking about at the period prior to 1800. Double digits begin to emerge slowly in the 19th century, and now it be, becomes a fact of our lives now. Of course, the Philippines would like to have more of it, uh, but some parts of the world have it. Uh, there's another question. Does trade cause growth? We have certainly had extensive debates about that issue uh, over the past uh, 20 years, but certainly before that, I guess Adam Smith uh, discussed that issue. Uh, what about this one? Does globalization cause inequality? I'm going to show you evidence uh, over 500 years uh, where it's the other way around, um, where inequality uh, tends to contribute to globalization. Uh, and I'll show you why that is so and how that works, uh, uh, and so on. So those are the issues. Uh, a lot of this debate is contentious when it's embedded in the year 2011, because we're so close to it. And it affects us, and we read about it in the newspapers, and politicians have positions, usually badly formed. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's quite contentious. Uh, but if you look back in history, you're not involved. So you can be more analytical about it. Uh, uh, so that's one argument, anyway. And also, life is simpler the farther back you go in time. The technologies are simpler. The institutions are simpler or just plain absent. 
um, so that it's easier to sort out the, the impact of the forces that matter. Um, and then presumably you can carry that to the present. Okay, as I uh, alerted you, if you were here on Tuesday, uh, here, um, uh, here are the epochs uh, that, uh, that really matter. Uh, and I, of course, we are taught now there was no such thing as an industrial revolution. There was an evolution that went by there. So everything's in now, think in terms of transitions, uh, not you know, you know, a once and for all spectacular change. Uh, that's true and the evidence supports it, but it's boring. Isn't it boring? You want to talk about revolutions, and abrupt changes. <laughs> and so I've, I've written these dates as if that were so. Um, and uh, actually there's you know, a lot of wobble on the dates. But basically, from 1492, uh, when Columbus uh, does his thing in the Americas, and then uh, a decade later when da Gama makes that end run uh, and takes over the Indian Ocean, uh, up to 1820. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you extensive evidence that that is an anti-global period. All agents involved uh, uh, are controlled by state action, and the states are acting as monopolies. Monopolies uh, are very good at raising price and cutting outfit, output, and that is not pro-global. That is anti-global. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk at great length about that. Uh, and then we enter the first global century, that one from up to 1913, where we think uh, by 1913, cap financial capital markets are as well integrated as they are today. Uh, there is no evidence that contradicts that assertion. Uh, they're extremely well integrated. Uh, uh, and so aren't commodity markets. Uh, trade barriers are quite low. Uh, by then of all sorts, transportation costs and tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Uh, and furthermore, labor markets are better integrated than they are today, uh, by far. Uh, there's very little intervention uh, to, to try to uh, cut off in migration to any of the high wage regions uh, in the world. Um, and now, of course, we live uh, in a world which is just the opposite, where there's quotas and other restrictions on in-migration that matter to potential Philippine out-migrants. So by 1913, uh, there had been a century evolution of integration of all three of those markets, commodity markets through trade, capital markets, financial capital markets, and labor markets through migration, uh, at least as much as we have today. Uh, and then we have this reaction. Uh, part of it is just by the impact of those wars, uh, but that First World War and then the second cannot be argued that they're exogenous. And they may be endogenous, uh, responding to economic events prior uh, to, to those conflicts. And in particular, uh, well, if you take uh, the more the World War II, uh, at least some part of Japanese uh, interest in developing the co-prosperity sphere uh, is driven by access to raw materials and foodstuffs. And that may be a little scary uh, because you see the same language appearing today in The Economist, The Star, and, uh, and other newspapers. Uh, uh, so one might wonder about the future, whether we're going to have a backlash driven by similar forces but in any case, we, uh, we got over that interwar episode and then reconstructed in the second global century uh, what, we, what we have now. Uh, so those are the, the main epochs uh, that we have, uh, and we wonder whether we're going to have another one, and we may want to have a conversation about that at the end of this lecture, uh, about whether there's any reason to expect a, another backlash, anything like the magnitude we had during the interwar.